Hi there, I'm Joe. Welcome to my channel and uh, thanks for watching. I have a lot of, a lot, I've got a dozen videos out there. Um, an awful lot of them are about my termite backhoe and there's a couple other miscellaneous ones. Today I'm going to talk about home towers. I watched a video last night of someone in New Hampshire putting up a tower for his personal use and although it seemed to be well done there are several items that I hope people following his lead and trying to put up a tower would correct. Now I'm a certified competent climber and competent rescuer. I've been climbing towers a couple of decades. I've been involved in amateur radio since the 60s and back then is when I first got hooked on going up towers and so forth because my uncle had towers. I also in the past well a couple of decades have worked part-time occasionally for an installer. Uh, he always needed an extra climber someone who had some engineering skills. So that's me. Excuse, excuse me there. So I want to, I was going to simply put comments in the video that I watched. It was someone in New Hampshire that was putting in a tower, not very tall, 38, 40 feet, so that was putting in a tower 38 or 40 feet so he could do his skylink which I think is internet it was good as far as he went there were a lot of comments particularly about the base and how it was installed but there are other issues too and I want to address some of those issues here today uh, this will be about three parts, I believe, that I'm going to do. The first is going to be lightning protection, which I, unless work was done that wasn't on the film, um, was not done very well. The second will be personnel or personal safety and climbing and harnesses and uh, standards for that. The third will be actual construction issues and probably more about my issues even though my tower was professionally engineered and the building department signed off on it. Uh, it was what was not mentioned in any of the drawings and so forth that should have been. Uh, so I'm going to go into that. So here we are, I'm going to switch, I believe I'm going to switch. So here we are, I'm in front of my tower, and this is 85 feet with a bunch of antennas on it. It's guide, G-U-Y-E-D, it uses guy wires, G-U-Y, and I don't know if we can see it from here, we can see it from here. Hopefully it shows up, yeah. Off in the distance, you'll see my 100-footer. And there's a wire in between, which is used for amateur radio communications around the world. The other antennas and so forth are much lo more local or television antennas. And I'm going to stop here for a second and tell you that the fourth part of this is going to be... Uh, talking about a couple of different standards. There's, there's one put out by Motorola, which is pretty much the ad hoc industry standard for erecting towers, communications facilities, and so forth. Another one is a TIA document, which I think deals primarily with wind load. And then one that Rohn, R-O-H-N, puts out that explains the TIA document and I couldn't even follow the explanation of the TIA document. I'm not involved in it day to day, so there's a lot I don't know, and I will gladly admit that. So 
here we are. Um, and by the way, none of this should be construed as how to do a commercial tower, municipal tower. This is strictly my own amateur radio towers, or if you're putting one up for yourself. Um, at least once a year we have reports of how a ham radio guy climbed the tower without checking his guys or had it installed wrong and ended up falling to his death or getting killed by the tower. So I'd like to at least give people ideas on what they should think about. So the first item is lightning protection. And technically I don't have any, although you could say I have a little more than nothing. When you build a tower, you have to ground it, which this tower is grounded. Here's one ground rod or ground wire. Uh, and there's a second one on the back. But these are done with acorn nuts. They're bolted on um, and they're bolted on the tower. Starting from the top, what you should have is a copper lightning rod that extends feet, several feet perhaps, above your highest communications device. That lightning rod creates a sort of umbrella over the tower so that any lightning coming close by will actually hit the lightning rod. Well, it's no good to have just a lightning rod, but you need to have a fairly heavy copper wire from that lightning rod coming down to your grounds. That copper wire should be what's called bonded. Um, in the in the industry, I think they call it CAD welding, but it's a, I think it's a magnesium fusing. You, you have a, um, a ceramic or a carbon um, mold, you put your wire in it, or your wire and your ground rod, and you put this powder in it, you ignite it, and it fuses it together. So you don't have any corrosion issues or the like. Now that ground should go all the way from the top as I said down to your two or more ground rods and if it were done correctly someone would have come out and measured how good your ground is going to be because maybe you'll need three or four ground rods and spaced much further apart if your soil I believe would be sandy and dry well that's not a very good thing if you're on top of ledge, that's not very good either. On top of that, each of the guy wires, and I don't know if I can show you this, each of the guy wire anchors right here, yeah, I don't want to climb in there, that's all poison ivy, but there's a diagonal wire and you can see perhaps, you can see that there is a piece of copper that's bolted to those guy wires and that also goes to a ground rod. And I don't think you can weld those because now you're changing the tensile strength of your guy wire. Well in addition to putting the lightning rod up top and making sure that it goes all the way down, you, you should, at each of your antennas or communications devices, if you have an intelligent device, have a grounding kit on the cable. So every cable gets bonded to your copper ground that comes down. In addition, where I go into my box to go into the basement, that's what this box is, I should have more grounding kits because you've changed direction and those should also be bonded. So you know, there's several things that I did not do properly when I put these in 20 years ago. You know, you're always learning. Uh, the only good thing is that the tower is well grounded and the mass sticks significantly up above any of my communications devices. So it's, 
it's better than nothing, but it's not, not a good solid copper ground. Now in addition, where you enter the building, which is right here, there is yet another ground. And inside this box are lightning arresters. So when you enter the structure, you're supposed to have lightning arresters. I also believe, and I don't have them here, is there should now be a third set of grounding kits for the cables before the lightning arresters. Anytime you go from horizontal to vertical, you're, I think you're supposed to have those. And it's been quite a few years, as I said. I do believe that the ground rod here and the lightning arresters, which are connected to it, are also bonded to my electrical service ground. I think that was a requirement that everything be at exactly the same potential. So that's, that's grounding, I think, in a nutshell. Um, once you get above a certain height and you don't have all your communications devices right near the top, there's additional work you have to do to create an umbrella for items that are partially up the tower. But that's, I really don't think anybody doing a home system is going to want to do that. So that's, that's lightning protection. I didn't see any of that. Uh, and in particular, his his Starlink was actually at the top and the only device, which makes it a perfect target for lightning. Um, so that's just something to think about if if you're going to do something like this, is lightning protection. Uh, the tower is grounded, yes. That's supposed to keep the bolt of lightning doing too much damage inside your house the way it's done but it does nothing for saving any of your equipment. So, um, and there are standards, again, uh, this Motorola document that's put together by a consortium of tower and communications companies um, that go into this in great detail. I think the document is close to 600 pages long. There's a whole chapter just on grounding. Grounding the building, grounding the tower. Uh, stuff like that. So um, in eight minutes or six minutes, uh, I gave you an overview. It's not something to be taken lightly. I've seen too many antennas explode. Well, I haven't seen them explode. I've had to replace them after they exploded. So that's, uh, that's something to think about. Um, other than that, uh, I think between the two towers, I have 11 or 12 grounding rods. Uh, each anchor gets a grounding rod. There's three anchors on each of the two towers. Each tower has at least two ground rods. There's a ground rod going into the house. Uh, and what I, I did all that, that's what the engineer specced. But what I did not do, number one, is I didn't weld these, CAD weld them or bond them. I used nuts and bolts and acorn nuts. Let's talk about personal safety. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but in fact, I've taken the course to be competent climber and competent rescuer. So uh, I know a little something about it. I don't certainly know enough to be a trainer or anything else. But uh, when you take one of those courses, your eyes get really open. It's really not a smart idea to work on a tower without ground support. At the very least, the person needs to have someone on the ground that can call 911 should there be an emergency and you become disabled on the tower. It's much better if you have two climbers, but uh, for instance, at home, it would be my wife. Well, before you start on the tower, you make sure that they understand that if you act funny or look funny, that you're supposed to call, that they understand what the phone number is. If you have 
company visiting and they're your ground support. Um, so that's, that's certainly part of personal safety is the preparation. Uh, along with that, the person on the ground at the very least needs a hard hat. Uh, and a lot of times, I think technically, you should always have a hard hat on the tower. There are times that you climb the tower and you come up underneath a support for an antenna. And if you don't have a hard hat on, it hurts. So you, you have to be very aware of that. Um, Health-wise, uh, it's good to use a pair of gloves. The birds love your towers. The birds leave stuff on the towers. You don't want to get that on your hands and then start rubbing your eyes or doing something else. Uh, it's just not good for you. Now, as far as personal safety, you're actually climbing. This, this, this is my bag of climbing gear, or most of it. Um, you have what's called a fall arrest lanyard, which I'll show you more in a minute. And then you have positioning lanyards. And your lanyards, when they get to this state, there's a date on here for expiration. When they get to this state, you need to replace them. Um, because I'm actually retired. I really don't climb that much anymore and I no longer use these. Uh, it's, it's not quite as critical. But the problem is that if you have them, you might be tempted to use them. So you should get rid of them. And the other issue with some of these is if they're old enough, the standard by OSHA, again, you're, you're doing it for yourself, OSHA doesn't really apply although it's good to follow it, is the way that these open with the safety locks may have changed. So it's always good to know that your equipment's up to date. Now, lanyards, they basically hold you onto the tower. There's two kinds. When you're climbing, ascending, descending, or simply working on a scaffold, you would use what's called a fall arrest. The fall arrest has a spring in it. And there's a specific way to use the fall arrest. Um, I always thought it was best to clip both lanyards in. Well, apparently that's not the case. Uh, if I remember the course, you only use one. And the reason for that is if you use two, then each cord only has to handle half the weight before it starts expanding. And that means that you could accelerate much more than you should before this starts slowing you down. So you come to a much more abrupt stop. So if you use a fall arrest lanyard, you should be aware of what kind it is and how it works. Uh, the other issue is Either with either the positioning or the fall arrest, although it's almost obvious on a positioning lanyard. But on fall arrest, uh, you have to be very aware of where it is in relation to your body climbing a tower. If you put it down low, well now you've got that much more to fall before the arrest part works and you're going faster and you get stopped more abruptly. So it's always, I'm going to say good to keep it above your head. I think it's the, the the goal is to keep it above your chest, certainly. So you, you need to know about harnesses. And don't take my word for any of this. If you're actually interested in this, you should look it up. You should talk to some of the suppliers for, um, oh, the most common would be uh, places that sell equipment to uh, tree cutters, to, to um, arborists. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure they would be happy to help you understand what the requirements are if you're really serious about it. Uh, I've seen a, several people hurt because they, oh, it's only a 40-foot tower. I'll, I, I can just climb it and I'll hold on to it or use a belt or use 
use a, a le old leather belt that was a climbing harness and uh, it gets them in trouble. Um, harnesses are not cheap, but they do the job. Now, that's fall arrest. Fall arrest is to prevent you from getting hurt if you slip and start falling. Positioning harnesses, which that's it, are to hold you in a position on a tower or a water tank or whatever, you're clipped in to some hold on the tower so that you can have your hands free and not worry about holding on to something. Um, and <laughs> it's very difficult to not use something to hold you in. Now there's several kinds of harnesses. Um, I'm going to, let me go get what I call a Peter Pan harness, but it's a light harness. This is the kind of harness that you would see used either when you're using a personnel lift or uh, maybe in one of the big box stores when they have a lift going on. There's not a lot to it. There's simply one clip where you clip into your fall arrest. Uh, it has, oh, there's a second one on the back. I take it back. Um, there's um, spots for your legs, but it's, it's pretty wide open. Um, not a whole lot around your waist, but it's, it's pretty safe. I'm going to take a second here to make sure we're still recording. Yep, okay. When I climb a tower, I use something a little different. This is the seat to my harness. If you're up there a long time, you want to make sure that you're comfortable. So this becomes an integral part of your harness that gets clipped in behind you. And it gives you two extra rings to put your positioning lanyards on if you need to. This is a full body harness. This is made to at least have one jacket underneath. Uh, I like to make it a little tighter than that. You have a belt and you have for both legs they clip in. And there's a lot of a lot of information and procedural issues that what you can and cannot do with these clips and rings and when you're climbing if you need to support your your um, lanyard you you're not supposed to clip it into your harness because it can get caught on something they have rings specifically made for it that will actually break if you catch it too hard um, so there's a lot to it, and I'm sure I've forgotten a lot, so don't take my word for a lot of this. But you can see, and this here, you can see this was a quick release. You can buy them with all quick releases, all regular buckles, a mixture. Um, I went this way just because I felt comfortable with it. And you can see there's, there's places to hook lanyards to, um, to hold you in the tower. I have a ring on the back. I have a ring on the front. Um, the ring on the back is typically where you would put the fall arrest because it keeps you away from the tower and um, it, I, guess it, I guess it minimizes how much damage it can do to you. So this would typically be on the back. And most of these are double lock. It takes two actions to open and close them. So 
And there's other small places like this. These are places you can hang accessories, extra carabiners. This is where the part of the buckle is. And here for the seat. So that's personal safety. Um, anytime you're in a lift, if you're climbing a tower, you should be buckled in or strapped in. Uh, several years ago, um, the fire department in one of the local towns was using their little bucket truck that they used to check the, the uh, pull box fire lines. They were putting up Christmas decorations. One guy was driving, one guy was in the bucket. It wasn't that high up, you know, 20 feet. And the truck hit a pothole, tossed the guy out of the bucket, killed him. So you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you sneeze, you get a cramp in your hand. If you are not properly strapped in, um, either with fall arrest or positioning, um, it, it's something that you may not walk away from alive. Uh, that's, I've got to say that. That's, it, 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 don't take it lightly. It's, uh, it's something that you really want to be aware of. Um, you don't need to go as far as I did. I mean, this is because we'd spend eight hours on a tower, three of us working on stuff, two or three, four days in a row. You want something that's comfortable, that's not too heavy, but it's going to save your life. Um, you can get away with the lighter ones. Um, I just don't because I've got, I've got the more expensive big one and I just trust it. Um, so I think that's going to be it for personal safety. I mean, I could go on and on, but I think that's all you need to know um, is to be aware that there are those devices out there and that if you're serious about towers and safety, you should know about these. Let's talk about construction mistakes, I think I would call this. Um, there was a lot of discussion about how to set your tower in this video I saw from New Hampshire. And there is a lot of discussion on it. Uh, there were a ton of comments about how the base was done, how it was done incorrectly, how it should have been done better. Well, I can tell you right now, mine is done incorrectly for two reasons. Number one, this is a guide tower. I told you that already. I have three anchors, 180, uh, 120 degrees apart at the appropriate tension and all the rest of it. But when you have a guide tower, it is expected to move. Well, the problem is I've got eight feet of base poured in concrete that's not going to move. And it is expected that either this will now start fatiguing and shearing here, or it will start fatiguing and shearing at my first joint. So there are several ways of doing this. You could put a concrete form tube in the ground, which is what I did, put in the appropriate rebar, put in some J hooks or whatever they call them, and mount a plate on the top that is free to move a little bit and bolt it in. A second is to use a base that has a pin in the middle and they make a special bottom section of tower that comes to a point that fits over that pin. Uh, I'm not going to tell you which is right and wrong. That's up to an engineer, local building codes, whatever. Um, all I can tell you is that this passed 20 plus years ago. Um, no one saw an issue with it. The professional engineer didn't have an issue. I understand the problems you can get into with concrete being in being around this galvanized metal. I watch this very carefully, uh, check it regularly, certainly check that and the guy wires before I climb. The issue that I had with the tower in New Hampshire, if I saw it correctly, is that he dug a hole and put concrete in it. 
and then put the tower in, or put the tower in, and then put concrete in. Well, up here in New England, and for a fair amount of the U.S., we have winters severe enough to cause the ground to freeze, and when you get frost heaves if there's water in the ground. You want to make sure that the side of your base is as smooth as possible, which is what a concrete form tube does. That way there, the ground will slide on the side of it instead of trying to lift it or distort it. I don't think one of the concrete tubes was used on that project. And I just want people to be aware that it's something to think about. Uh, probably you don't have to worry about it in Florida, but you'll have other issues. Enlightening capital of the world, I think. Um, but that's that's one issue. Is is I use the form concrete form tube on both towers. Um, the uh, tower itself is set in concrete. Yeah, probably could have done with less concrete and stone more on the top because the stone will move with the water so that wouldn't have been so bad my hole i had stone in the bottom set the set the tower in the stone so that it would drain so if you if you start pouring concrete and put your tower in it you're going to fill up the legs which is a really bad thing and eventually you'll get a blister and it and the water will freeze and it'll just blow this pipe wide open. Um, that makes it really unsafe. So that's, I think that's the biggest thing besides the lightning protection we already talked about. Um, the, the biggest thing is, is my base. Uh, should have done it differently. Now on this box, you see this funny looking wood. This is an anti-climb box. Wraps around the tower. Makes it almost impossible for someone to simply come up and start climbing. Uh, they'd have to either pull the plywood off or get a ladder. I mean, you can't protect 100% of what you're doing, but you should take precautions. Um, it's, it's, it's challenging and it's it calls to some of the folks that think it's a, a daring thing to do is to climb a tower. So you need to protect them against themselves and need to protect yourself. So you want to make sure that your tower is safe when no one's around watching people on it. So that's, that's um, I think that's it in a nutshell. Uh, again, I talked about lightning protection. That would be the biggest thing. Cables, they do make standoffs for the cables. Um, I have seen people use wire ties. I've seen most of the wire ties fall off in five to 10 years, even the UV ones. I've seen people use tape. I've seen the tape unravel after five or 10 years. Um, I use a combination. I have tape and I also have 14 gauge solid copper wire that's insulated. Um, it lasts. The big thing is you can't make it too tight. You'll pinch your cable. That's not a good thing. But it keeps your cable from flopping around. Um, that's if you don't use cable trays that come down because the cable trays will hold the cables perfectly aligned away from the structure, away from any bends, away from bolts. Uh, but it's it's a fair expense. Um, you can see I didn't do it. It's a ham tower. Uh, there's several things I didn't do, uh, but I'm not about to change them at this point. Uh, my goal at this point is to make sure that this tower stays upright, that it's safe for my neighbors and myself. And I do that by regularly checking the base, the guy wires, um, the anchors, I have, what is it, a yard and a half or two yards of concrete buried four feet down. Um, I really want to be careful here because I think this is where I picked up poison ivy. Um, there, there is um, 
the the shackle for the end of the guys, the turnbuckles, the ground uh, ground wire, and at least once every couple of years or whenever I'm going to climb, I remove all the leaves and I check to see that that one inch anchor bar is not losing its galvanizing and is perfectly solid still. Uh, that's that's one of the things that kills people. They don't they don't check the guy wires or they don't check the joints on the way up. I've seen bolts. These tower sections are every 10 feet. When you're climbing, you should check all the bolts on the way up. So those that's 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 a safety thing. That isn't a construction issue that I had that I should have done differently. Um, done differently more professionally is how you run your cables. Certainly the base. Um, whether you embed it in eight feet of concrete or four feet of concrete or one foot and then use gravel um, or use the pivot because it's a guide tower. Um, those are all discussions between you and the professional engineer that's designing it for you to, to make it safe. Uh, I'm going to pause here to see if there's anything else about what I should have done differently. Um, I don't think you can see it. Uh, it's right where the first set of guys is hooked to the tower up there you can see they look thicker well those are anti-torsion bars and they're rigid bars that don't pivot on the tower so if the tower tries to spin because of wind or a rotor that you have on it those along with the tension on the guy wire will prevent the tower from twisting itself into the ground uh, towers have done that uh, so that's something to be aware of. A lot of people I hear I've I've heard complaints from the two guys that I climbed for. Um, people put up the tower, say no, I'll never have that many antennas. Well, I'm starting to get there. I've got three antennas up there for television, and then I've got uh, an amateur radio antenna. Uh, the only good thing is that I'm guide right at the base of those so that the tower is really secure. But it would be good if I could get a couple of those antennas off. Uh, it's just not, it's, it's near what the wind load should be on this tower. So that's it. Um, as I said, I'm gonna pause and decide if I have something else to say about what I would have done differently for, for installing these towers. The last part of this video is going to cover resources. There are a couple that keep coming up time and time again. One is the TIA or Telecommunications Industry Association number 222, the standard for towers and antenna supporting structures. Of particular importance in this has to do I believe with wind load and that's something that changed that made an awful lot of towers that are up these days not compliant now they're grandfathered in I'm sure but one that kept coming back to me uh, with the two people I climbed for was that for Rhone 25 which is something a lot of ham radio guys use and a lot of homeowners use for their antennas. Um, the wind speeds and wind loads changed and became much more conservative. It used to be, uh, I'm going to say this in layman's terms because I don't know where the exact wording is, but it used to be, as explained to me, that if you put up Rhone 25 and you guide the Rhone 25, you can have up to 30 feet of Rhone 25 above the highest guy wire. Supposedly that's now only 10 feet. So 
uh, and that's because um, the industry standard uh, pushed a lot of wind loads. It used to be so many seconds at some speed. Uh, now I think it's an average. Um, they redid the map on what the standard wind gusts are in the country. They've changed the map on what, I'll say, what area you're in or what uh, force you can expect. So, uh, and this document, which I think currently, if I'm not wrong, is TIA 222G, uh, the... It's, it's complicated enough that Roan put out a document that was a description of TIA 222 and what it meant to the Roan Towers. I couldn't even follow their discussion and description of it, never mind the actual document. On top of that, there's a document, I believe it's called R56, that's published by Motorola. It's uh, 518 pages as of 2005. I don't have a newer one. I'm not a member of the association. Really didn't want to pay the money for the document. Uh, I could look at it at one of my co-climbers he, where he does it full time. But uh, it's a document by Motorola that uh, has a bunch of committee members, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven 10, 11, 11 members at that time, which um, a lot of them were Motorola, but they also uh, listened to some of the actual tower people and OSHA and so forth. And this, as I look away and try to get back to the first page, the preface page, so I can tell you what it actually says. It's standards and guidelines for communication sites. So this goes into soil, how you test the soil, how compact it is, how you do your base, how you do your lightning protection, how you do your cable protection, how you put up your communications building. It goes into a lot. Site design, communication site building design, external grounding, internal grounding, power sources, surge protector, minimizing site interference, equipment installation. And it goes on and on and on. Um, I wouldn't expect anyone putting up a home tower to know anything about this. But in looking at it as a amateur radio operator, as a guy that does climbing occasionally, as an electrical engineer, not a professional engineer, but just a double E, I find some of it very interesting, especially when someone asks me how to put up a tower in at their house. Uh, being a ham radio operator, we have several people that say, hey, how would you do this? And um, it sheds a lot of light on that. So there's certainly documentation out there. Uh, the homeowner is not going to want to read any of this. Uh, but without knowing that it's out there or talking to someone who knows more about it, you can put up a tower that certainly looks safe but has issues. And uh, I think this is part four. I'm recording it out of sequence. We're now going to do part three, and I'm going to tell you some of the issues I have with my towers. Even though they were designed by a professional engineer, the building department signed off on everything. Uh, supposedly everything's all honky-dory, but, uh, you know, if you go to New Hampshire, you have even less oversight. So you really have to know what you're doing, and something that looks logically correct may not be as safe or um, structurally sound as you might expect. So that, that takes care of the reference material that I have here. Yes, I think that's it. Um, I covered the four areas I was, that kept me up at night, believe it or not. I, I really wanted to make sure 
that I said what I wanted to say. Uh, I'll have to review this, make absolutely certain that I didn't give you any false information. Um, as I said, this is all what I did on my towers 20 years ago. It's the little bit that I've done commercially uh, that gives you a different aspect on how to do things. Uh, the safety issue, the lightning issue, all of that, don't take it at my word. If you are going to put up a tower, you could certainly think about what I said, but go to your building inspector, go to a professional engineer, talk to the manufacturer of the tower. Even if you buy the Rhone tower or some other tower surplus, get a hold of the manufacturer and uh, make sure that you understand the consequences of what you are doing and the type of construction you're doing. Uh, I, I, when I was younger, I did some really stupid things, climbing towers and, and taking shortcuts, and uh, none of them have come back to bite me yet, but uh, there's been too many people dying putting up towers or working on towers. Just recently, someone from up here, a ham radio guy, went to Aruba to do contesting, which is a type of communications event, uh, and decided to climb a tower in Aruba, and the tower was so rusted because, it, I mean, Aruba has salt air all the way around it, and the tower collapsed and killed him. Um, I, he I hear that way too often. Uh, once a year is, is too often, and sometimes it's three or four times a year that you hear about it, never mind the ones you don't hear about. So it's, it's not to be taken lightly. Um, towers are great. I'd rather climb a tower than a ladder any day. Uh, if it's put up properly, it's, it's, it's got the best foundation in the world. But um, it's just something to think about. So thanks for watching if you stuck it out to the end. Uh, if you like it, say so. Put some comments down. Um, I, don't, I, I only have a couple of subscribers. Um, get a few comments here and there. So uh, have fun with it. And uh, the next video is going to be yet totally different uh, and I'm, I'm going to surprise you with the heading on it hopefully I can fake a couple people out with it so have a have a good day again thanks for watching if you like it uh, let me know all right